This episode is brought to you by Morty, Rizova, Recon, and Patreon supporters like you. Supporting our sponsors supports our work. This year, we're hosting Recon, the Reality Escape Convention, virtually, so that we can bring our entire global community together. Our team has decided to alternate one year in person, one year virtual, and this year, we are doing it online. We have one game this year. We've commissioned it from Mark Larson, who created Escape from Escape Island for Recon two years ago, and that game was a delight. He is once again back and blending a little bit of Escape Room Insider design along with some silly and playful game elements. It's going to be a blast. Recon has a variety of ticket types to meet your needs, and the basic ticket is free. No tricks. We want our global community at Recon, and we hope to see each and every one of you there August 19th and 20th, 2023. You can learn more at realityescapecon.com. Details in the show notes. Tickets are on sale now. Welcome to the Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need a getaway from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles, and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. Today's guests are from Colorado, Linda Klein and Brian Corrigan of Farm to Spaceship. For the past few years, they have been bringing elements of immersive design, fun and play into more traditional business environments. Welcome, Linda and Brian. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. I met Linda at the Denver Immersive Gathering, and I was really intrigued by some of the work that she was doing in Denver with local businesses and introducing immersive elements into them. And so I'm excited to have you on. Farm to Spaceship is a fantastic name. How did you guys come up with it? We work across the state of Colorado, and we were in the southern part of the state, specifically in the San Luis Valley. Well, it's my favorite part of the state. It's very eclectic, and there's a lot of farms down there, and there's actually even like UFO watchtowers. And so we were on a road trip, and we're driving through the San Luis Valley, and you know, I look to my left, and I see the UFO watchtower. And then a little bit down the road, there is a sign with a cow on it for a cow crossing. And I'm like, wow, the San Luis Valley is really everything from farms to spaceships. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) There you go. And then we started thinking about it and it's like, wow, Colorado is actually from farm to spaceship because there's a lot of agriculture and there's also aerospace. And those are kind of the top industries. And so... We just felt it was very fitting for working in Colorado. And it's a great conversation starter because it it asks more questions than it answers. Truly. I mean, we used it as a conversation starter. (laughs) I love that. So from what I can see on your website, Farm to Spaceship pairs local artists, designers, foodies, entrepreneurs, and community leaders to develop experiential offerings for customers and the community. And you do this through things like Adventure School and Adventure Lab. So can you tell us a little bit about these programs? I'll start on Adventure School. Adventure School is a year-long program where we do bring these people together, sometimes artists, small business entrepreneurs, and they discover how their practice, their business, what they do intersects with the experience economy. And the experience economy is important because 74% of Americans prefer experiences over stuff and things. And that data point comes from before COVID. So we can only imagine how high that percentage is. And many businesses aren't thinking about how to engage in the experience economy. They are not thinking about how their art, their practice, their business is already an experience and how you can design for it. That's kind of the kernel of the adventure school, but it has a lot of layers because it's very dynamic and it depends on what sort of sector we're working in. Is this like a course or a class that like local businesses and artists can take? 
I like to think of it as like a, a business accelerator, but specifically focused on experiential offerings. Those experiential offerings can be for sale or they can be free. They can really be a business or they can live in the public realm. And we like to mix them all together and really kind of think about how does the public realm really interact with the private sector or the private realm and vice versa. And really thinking of a business's front door as a portal and thinking about how can you really integrate a storytelling layer into the built environment. Again, that brings people from outside to the indoors and indoors to the outside. So can you walk us through a example of what you mean here? Like something that's real in the world. Yeah. One of our cohorts, their business name is called Rainbow Dome. And Rainbow Dome is where experiential art meets roller skating. And so Rainbow Dome, they do pop-ups outdoors and they make really cool spaces that you can roller skate through. And again, just kind of experience the art on wheels. We like to say it's really fun. <laughs> and then they also uh, do indoor roller skating installations where they do pop-ups at normal kind of roller skating rinks. And they bring all of their sparkle and all their glitter and transform it into an immersive experience. So that's kind of an example of maybe how it can really live in the like uh, public realm and then how it can live like inside of a business. And I, I want to offer another example, too, because people operating in, in your sphere, like your audience, they're more acutely aware of experience design and uh, immersive art and those kind of things. And I think the great thing about the Adventure School is it also is a platform for people who've never thought of their business as an experience to create an experience layer. And when someone's a beginner in this world, they aren't necessarily thinking anything too flashy. And we had one of our members of the cohort has a, it's a home goods store, sort of a curated home goods store called Tea is for Table. And it was such an eye opener for her to think about how could her store be an experience? She was about to kind of give up on retail. And what she designed were these dinner parties that happened in her store in the front window after closing. And it would give people an opportunity to experience the stuff she has for sale on the table. And the caterer would come in and serve the food. She'd have other artists involved, maybe a musician and that kind of thing. And it made an emotional connection with people and her store. And then, of course, what happens after the dinner? People are buying all that stuff. And everybody walking by is going, what's going on in that store? It looks like fun. So that's a really simple layer, too. It doesn't have to be something big. So it sounds like what you're talking about is using experience design to go and create both opportunities for people to bring larger numbers of people into their business and also kind of a reason for them to go back to a business that they might not have visited again. A great byproduct of this program is that business owners and entrepreneurs begin to understand they are artists and artists begin to understand they are entrepreneurs and small businesses. And it's all one thing. And when you understand yourself that way, like, oh, my canvas is my small business. And it also takes artists out of the position of being the starving artist and into a position of, no, I create economic value. I just feel like a lot of artists sometimes feel like they're selling out if they're going to create something of commercial value. And I really like that you're pointing out that's not the case. It's not bad or wrong to create something that's both artistic and has commercial value. I think it's kind of interesting really as like a creative sector that there's even this vocabulary that we subscribe to that we're going to be starving artists and that there's almost like a validity to your work when you subscribe to that. But I don't see in other industries, if you like, say, graduate with, you know, a tech degree where you're like, I'm going to be a starving technologist because I'm going to just give it all to the industry. You know, we work in community development and we've kind of realized that the placemaking starts with really the thoughts within your mind. Right. And so I think that's one of the things that we try to do with the adventure school is to just like X out the notion that the starving artist is even a thing. I personally hate the way that 
culturally, we glorify things like mental illness and substance abuse and suffering as the only path to artistic success. It's sort of like pick your poison, which to me has always felt like a very false offering. Well, and the fact that we uh, label people as artistic or not artistic, um, Mm -hmm. it all just depends on what is your canvas. That was the other thing that you were touching on that I had a really strong positive reaction to, which is my background is in UX design. I've been doing this for a long while. And everywhere I go, I kind of find myself asking the question, what's the experience that I'm having here? Is this deliberate? Is it not? And I think more often than not, when I'm walking into stores and brick and mortar businesses, the answer is that the experience that is being presented is haphazard. It's not one of choice. It's not one where someone looked at this and said, the signage is a canvas. The front door is a canvas. My windows are a canvas. The interior is a canvas. The things that we're offering and the way that we're stocking it are also a canvas. It's you know why I do most of my shopping online. It's almost every time I walk into a store, I can't find anything that fits me. That's a canvas and it's forcing me to make decisions as a customer. We use some language around that. We call them experience dials or sliders. Like a, imagine like a soundboard that's got like a mixer, an equalizer. It's got all these sliders on it. And if you label each of those sliders with different experience design elements, you can learn to slide those up and slide those down to get the perfect mix that you're looking for. And I I think one of the things that maybe you're speaking to could provide some language around is sort of the humanizing of the experience as the experiencer. Does it matter that I'm there? Where do I get to choose or how do I affect the outcome? And you think of maybe a small market as opposed to a big grocery store. Well, someone behind the counter could easily know your name. Right. And that Mm -hmm. really changes the experience, even though they might not have something in your size or have what you want. That's dialing up the personal part of the experience. The funny thing about what you just said to me is that the way that you just defined this out is also the definition of what we at Room Escape Artists use to decide whether we're going to cover something or not. Is something an immersive experience, something that we have agency in? Does it matter that I'm the person who went into the experience versus anyone else? You know, if I go into a Broadway show, that show is going to be the same show whether I'm there or not. But if I go into something that is more immersive, it does matter that I'm there. And if someone else is there, then it's going to play out differently. So I love that we have this sort of philosophical overlap and you're bringing it into a very different space. I have a follow up question to what Linda mentioned earlier about your design mixer, which I really enjoyed that analogy. What would be some of the different labels that you would have on the different sliders? It really goes into the senses. So really kind of sight, smell, touch, taste, right? And so really kind of thinking about the senses. Then there's also sliders with the interaction with the place, really kind of thinking about the placemaking aspect. And then the interaction with the people, like the people to people interaction. And then also really kind of thinking about emotional design. What type of emotion are you trying to design for? Those are kind of some of the categories that we've picked with the sliders, but they're totally a work in progress right now. When we use the sliders, we kind of think about what would an experience where if you had every single one of them, like say, turned all the way up. Would that be a fun experience? To me, I think that would be way too overwhelming, right? Like all the smell, all of the textures, right? All of the taste, all the interaction. And I think a slider that we added that I think will speak to your audience is we have a slider called friction because you want the right amount of friction and it based on someone's expectation of the situation. Uh, friction is kind of what keeps the, it sort of determines how long the interaction is and how much it takes to get through the interaction, the right amount of friction makes those opportunities for it to matter that I'm there. If an escape room is entirely too easy, you kind of just blow through it and you don't feel like you've accomplished anything. So you need to have some amount of challenge, some barrier, some hurdle so that the person participating feels like they accomplished a thing. Yeah, that's, and that's why I think escape rooms are such a great example of friction. And I know some live in the moment are dialing the friction. 
Yes. To personalize the situation. And I think you could say that's also true for an artist, entrepreneur, or a small business owner who is really skilled at the experience design. They can adjust the amount of friction in the moment to let that person have the experience they're looking for. Brian, you used the term placemaking when you were describing some of the work. What does that mean? You can think of placemaking as just, I guess, the deliberate design of the public realm. Thinking about where you might put a trash can, where you might put a street light, where you might put that bench. But then I think creative placemaking kind of takes it to the next level and really starts to think about how is this place different because of where it's located and the culture that exists within that place. And it's a lot more intentional and unique and different. So when you're talking about adding in immersive elements into non-immersive businesses, why shouldn't business owners just make a space more beautiful? That seems to be the traditional path here. You want to make something feel more valuable, just make it prettier. What's the differentiator here? I think the thing is that we always kind of talk about is what are the opportunities for co-creation and really engaging people outside of the business? Like you could just call them, let's just say for simplicity, your customers. So let's just think about two businesses here. We have one that just makes something completely beautiful, right? And we can all say, oh, wow, this space is amazing. Look at the craftsmanship. And then over here, we have this space that maybe feels like a little bit more handmade. You can see that actually a human created it, right? Like maybe the paint lines are a little jagged or crooked, but that space was co-created with their customers where it allowed for the customers to have a say and an opinion over how the space should be. And is what we like to say is that their fingerprint is on the space. And that's important because just kind of think about like when you're involved in a project and you get to put your fingerprint on it and that you get to actually have some sort of agency over really the result of it, like that leads to love. And if you do it right, <laughs> if you do it right, it leads to love. <laughs> uh, and that's what we want, right? We want spaces that we love, right? That I feel at home at, that you can bring your friends to and say, hey, look at that. I helped make that. Isn't that cool? And again, it's not to say that one is better than the other or one is more right than the other. I think that there's room for all of these to exist together. But again, I think that there is kind of something very special about spaces that are co-created. What does it lead to when you do it wrong? <laughs> you wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> For me, when I see this done wrong, it comes out in one of two ways. One is it just feels excessively processed and kind of fake. The other is it feels too niche, too particular, like someone made their idea in a vacuum and never took any input from anyone else and never thought that maybe other humans might want to exist in a space that's not quite this extreme, sort of a hug of death. Think about a brand or a business can spend a lot of time going, this is who we are. This is who we are. This is all that's our marketing or that's how they present themselves. Here's who we are. Here's who we are. And it changes when they say, who are we together? Who are we now that you're here? and change all those sentences into questions. And I think we can sense that when it's sort of human shaped, when the brand or the business or the art is like the host of a party. And it's like, oh, that's great, you're here. Well, let me connect you with this event. Let me show you what's going on. Let me show you how you fit in. And I think we can sense that in a brand. When it's perfect, we cannot connect because there is no perfection in the human experience. It's sort of like if you're having guests over and your house is entirely too clean, it makes people feel uncomfortable. Like, I can't step on this carpet because there's this vacuumed pattern into it and I'm going to make a mistake. The garbage cans are all empty. And if I throw something out, then they're not going to be empty anymore. And also, it's going to be really clear what I threw out. And it's off-putting. Yeah, like it makes you feel overly formal. But I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you guys touched on something else that I talk about all the time, which is the value of having these like Insta worthy photo ops. And I feel like this is something that a lot of escape rooms 
miss the mark on. You have these gorgeous, beautiful rooms. You guys are really good at scenic design. And then you have your players take photos in front of a blank wall holding up a silly sign. Take some of that creativity and put it out in the lobby where everybody can see. And it's an important marketing tool. And I feel like you guys are talking about taking it even one step further and not just having a beautiful aesthetic, but also incorporating an interaction into it. I just want to add another layer to that. I think about those Instagrammable experiences. If you think of that as part of the experience economy, a delineation that Brian and I talk about a lot is the next step from the experience economy is the transformation economy, where we desire to be transformed. We want to be becoming all the time. And so if you think of that Instagrammable moment, well, what is that moment where you give someone an opportunity to make meaning out of the moment? You share a purpose there's some shared purpose in that moment. And it takes it into a different realm than just a photo op. We're taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Morty. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing your escape rooms and other immersive social outings. And Morty is now available for all to use on its brand new web experience, in addition to its fantastic iPhone app. I believe in Morty so much that I have a stake in it as an advisor. If you've been following along with Morty, you know that they now have web availability and you can use this to track all of your games. I know a lot of our listeners are extremely robust players. You guys probably have lists in the hundreds of escape rooms over the years that you've kept up. You can now import your list to Morty. They have a special AI powered blitz tagger tool. You don't have to tediously enter in every game manually into the Morty database. You can just upload your list and it will match your game and import all of your played games automatically. As someone who had an impossibly large list of games that I had played, I said to the Morty team, there's no way that I am going to go and spend all the time I need to get my games into this by hand. I need a tool. And they rose to the occasion. And with the Blitz Match tool, you can upload a list and let the bots do most of the work for you. You can access this at blitzmatch.morty.app. You can learn more at mortyapp.com slash repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to sign up and get a special badge for our listeners. Link in details are in the show notes. What you're touching on for me is it's the reason why I can't stand the selfie palace type of business because I think that experiences should have both a purpose and a soul. And by that, I mean the person who enters it, there should be something for them to accomplish, something for them to do, something for them to get out of it. And the soul, it should feel like it was made by a human with care and love and craft. And this notion of I'm going to go to a place so I can take a series of photos that represent things I didn't actually do in a place that doesn't really exist, that is lacking both purpose and soul. I think it was a shiny, fun object that we had for a certain moment in time. But I think you're right. People are looking for more than that. If we're comparing Insta-worthy things that came with the rise of Instagram, and I feel like that's going down and something like TikTok is on the rise because it's video and it's about interactions and not just a still life, not just a snapshot right now. It's about how something made you feel. It reminds me of like the nest. So there's this experience in Los Angeles that is kind of escape room, but mostly it's like an immersive interactive story and you have this moment of introspection and now you have kind of become part of this experience and you're right that experience has really left a mark on a lot of people people talk about it all the time and i think part of the reason why is because it did ask you to give back a little bit and become part of it at the end and if you're interested in the nest 
We interviewed the creators on season three, episode 10. You know, I think the thing about escape rooms is there's the power of play to bring people together to kind of create that social cohesion, whether you're there with like someone you know really well, or you're there with a stranger. Again, the power of what we're talking about here is that I think people are craving that human to human interaction. Well, there's a ton of agency in play and no one can be playing unless they agree to play. Everyone chooses to play. And that right there is its tiniest little level of agreement. And you can build on it, whether you're designing an escape room or community building. I always think about there's this positive side of things that people opt into. There's also this negative side of play that people are sort of forced or coerced into, particularly in business environments, the mandatory fun or the excessively prescriptive forms of play. What are your thoughts on those? <laughs> forced fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, it's funny because we talk about this a lot. You have to opt in in order to actually play. If you don't opt in, that is forced fun. And I wouldn't really categorize that as play. I think that there's like one side to why play doesn't exist in the workplace. And we call this serious. Linda and I always kind of talk about like, why is serious driving the car? Why can't fun be driving the car? But I think serious is easier to do. When you think of hierarchies, it's like serious exists at the top of the pyramid and it's easier to do because you don't actually have to have a relationship with someone. You can just kind of bark orders, but fun and play on the other hand, as we were just saying, to do it right, you have to opt in, which flattens the organization. You have to see people for who they are and you actually have to get to know them a little bit. Real fun requires a little bit of a commitment to the person. You have to know a little bit about them. So how do you get past that in an organization? It's the foosball table in the middle of the tech office that no one ever touches. Even gym class in its own special way, there are these environments that are all around us that are implying that fun and play are supposed to happen, but the reality of what is actually occurring is very different. The foosball table, the giant Jenga and all those things, (laughs) they are examples of statements. This is fun. This is fun. We're going to have fun. And I think to create fun, you have to ask, what would be fun? How can we have fun? The other person has to be included because not everything's the same fun for everybody. Just because it's brightly colored balls doesn't mean it's fun. So I think it has to include an openness and it has to start with a question. I used to have a client. They don't exist anymore. So I don't feel bad about telling this story, but they had a slogan. Their motto, their slogan, their catchphrase, their everything was execute with excellence. And They had so internalized this notion that everything they do is executing with excellence, even when they weren't, because it's what we do. It's right there. It's written underneath the logo. And I think that that is I think that's one of the struggles that I see a lot of companies grapple with is that they tell these stories about what it is they do and what it is they are. And they don't always do the hard work of figuring out if they're doing the thing they say they're doing. Yeah. One thing with it too, is I think it comes down to trust. (laughs) I think sometimes there's just a huge lack of trust. Fun requires trust. And what's fun for me is maybe not fun for the other person sitting next to me, asking them what is fun, as Linda was saying, what is fun for you? And how does that look? And then being okay with the answer (laughs) and trusting them that they'll go ahead and they'll kind of be able to deliver on that and still be quote unquote productive and produce what's needed. But I think that's the thing is I think it's just really, it comes down to trust. What do you mean by fun? What does fun mean to you at this point? Because for me, as someone who has been writing about fun experiences for a long time now, The word has sort of lost a lot of its meaning to me. I know I like it, but it's really difficult to define. And a lot of people would agree with you. It's like, you know, fun when you're having it. And that's (laughs) that's the definition. I think it's one definition. I'm not going to say this right, but it was like prolonged delight. I kind of liked that. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's more than a blip. 
for me, like there's a lot of things that I find fun that are not on paper fun. I like fixing things and that can be a long drawn out arduous process of trial and error. And you get to the end and it worked and that feels fun. Or I love a good crisis in a very weird way. I like it when things go absolutely horribly wrong and I have to just navigate it. I'm really good in the crisis. I mean, it sounds like you like troubleshooting. You like problem solving. And I like Linda's definition of prolonged delight because I feel like for you, it sounds like you like acute delight. Basically like that explosion of delight when you've solved the problem. But the path there is kind of arduous. (laughs) But is that a valid form of fun? (laughs) Well, you know, I think the thing about it too is there's different kinds of fun, right? And I think is what we're talking about is I do think that there's the fun, like maybe eating a piece of candy, right? Where you're like, ooh, this is sweet and there's sugar and oh my gosh, I'm just like totally into it. But then there's fun that when you, again, in the moment, it was not fun. It could actually be scary, right? Yeah. And like the thing that, like the example coming to my mind is someone who maybe gets chased by a bear. Right. And <laughs> or a horror like, movie. Like, yeah, like exactly. haunted, haunted houses. Exactly. Right. Like that's not fun. Like in the moment, it's terrifying. But it's fun to tell this story because you get all of the dopamine and just the serotonin is flowing when you're telling other people about this like totally horrendous thing that you went through. <laughs> I mean, and that is a coping mechanism that I use. I will constantly tell myself if things are going absolutely terribly wrong, like, okay, I'm going to skip to the part where this is funny. (laughs) Oh, I think that's the struggle with fun, too, is that at some point along the way, someone added an an NY to the word Mm -hmm. and fun and funny became a pair and they really don't have anything to do with each other, which is kind of interesting. Not inherently. Mm -hmm. I think fun can also be experienced as what would be labeled flow state. When you are in that perfect amount of friction, maybe that's what you're thinking about. Like in the crisis, there's Mm -hmm. friction. So you get to use all the parts of you that are good at that. And if you were to sail in right through, it wouldn't necessarily be perceived as fun. But when we are at that perfect moment of just enough friction, it's different for everybody what it is. And honestly, I'm a creative, uh, I have a background in comedy. And one of my favorite flow states is to have a problem that a spreadsheet will solve. I love spreadsheets <laughs> <laughs> and I can get in my flow state for an afternoon working on a spreadsheet. So you touched on a whole bunch of things that I want to get to. The first one though, is this notion of fun and funny being connected in English. And I don't know the answer. I'm going to toss this out to our listeners, especially our listeners who speak other languages. Does that correlation exist in your culture because there is this notion this the sapir wharf hypothesis the bad definition of this is having a word for something kind of culturally defines it so in english we don't really have a term for light blue it's just light blue and that's what we call it but we do have a term for light red and it's pink and we very clearly define pink as a concept, whereas light blue and blue are all kind of the same. Maybe navy and blue are different unless you're a graphic designer. That's interesting. I didn't think about this until just now, but like in Cantonese, the term for fun, like ho wan would be like, it's good play, I guess would be the terms ho wan is good play. And then something that's funny is ho siu is good laugh. It's like when you went into limit languages, I was like, oh, it actually does make sense to me. Like Chinese tends to be kind of poetic in certain ways. Computer is the word for electric and brain. The word for a movie is the word for electric and picture. And the word for phone is the characters for electric voice, right? <laughs> I have read that so many Chinese businesses that have both Chinese and English names, the Chinese name is this like beautiful poetic name. And then the English <laughs> version is this very simplified, basic presentation of the idea. Yeah, (laughs) I'd believe it. (laughs) 
Resova is your all-in-one, all-inclusive software for bookings made specifically with escape rooms in mind. Incorporating community-driven features, it's designed to follow the guest journey. From selecting times to book, waiver management, integrated point of sale system, and follow-up emails. Resova is the ultimate online reservation software designed to elevate the guest experience, increase game master efficiency, drive sales, and improve operations. PG, what is fantastic about Resova is that they offer something for the owners, something for the guests, and something for the GMs. What does Resova offer GMs? I saw their calendar system and it was beautiful. It was simple. It's easy to use. When you're a GM, what you care about is increasing your efficiency. You're already juggling so many different things, welcoming customers, running games. You don't want to have to worry about handling a super complicated system. Their calendar view makes it very clear at a glance what times are booked, which slots are open, whether the team has already paid or not, and how many people it's booked for. They also have the integrated point of sale system, which just makes your job that much easier and that much more efficient. And with everything being so integrated, your game masters only have to be trained on one system. To learn more, get a free demo and find out how easy Resova can make your transition to their technology. Head over to resova.com slash REA and be sure to use our link or drop our name. Because as a thank you to Repod listeners, Resova is offering up to $100 in Google AdWords when you sign up through our link. Details in the show notes. Linda, you were just mentioning your background in improv. Talk to us a little about how that has influenced the work that you do. Well, I think the tenets of improv are pervasive in anything someone does. And I think applied improvisation is a valid form of functioning, of thinking for any, anything you want to take on. You know, it's, it's the basic concepts of trust, yielding, committing, listening. And of course, the one that most people know, yes, and what if I plus everything instead of minusing everything? What can I do to add to? Take what is and add to acceptance. So I think anybody who's had the tiniest little bit of improv exposure has some or all of those. It just it changes how you think about things. And a a typical path can be once you learn improv, you want to look for opportunities to perform improv. And then it becomes improv performance, which is a really different thing. And it's unfortunate that the word comedy got connected to the word improv because people get intimidated because all they hear about is improv comedy. And they're like, I'm not funny. That sounds scary. And improvisation really has nothing to do with that. It it did happen to be my path, but in my maturity, I'm seeing how it's really not to the best interest of the word improv to have anything to do with performance. I mean, we're improving together right now. Mm -hmm. There's a structure that we're following, but no one here knows what anyone else is going to be saying. And we're just collectively making something together. We are masters at it. We are masters at it. And it's somehow when you expose your mastery to it, it becomes clunky all of a sudden. That's really interesting. I just wanted to know if you had any examples of some small ways that businesses could incorporate fun experiences into their shops and storefronts. The example I use a lot is a bookstore where there is a thunderstorm inside the bookstore every day. You don't know when it's going to happen and it's not advertised. It's not really part of the name of the bookstore or anything. It's just this cool thing that happens and done through sound effects and projection and you know laser stuff. And it's just one of those things where it's completely obtuse, but it's kind of delightful. It's a nice thunderstorm, not a scary one. And, <laughs> and it's the kind of thing where you walk out and go, I got to tell somebody about that. And the fact that it's not addressed and that doesn't really have a label you bring all the meaning to it. We talk about opportunity for your own interpretation, right? To make it personal. It's not interpreted for you. It just happens. And then it's over. And then the bookstore is the bookstore. Another one that we use a lot as an example in our adventure school is the Magic Castle Motel in Los Angeles. And they have a red phone by the pool. And essentially you pick it up and it's the popsicle hotline. 
and they will then bring you popsicles on a silver platter <laughs> to the pool. And so you can really get popsicles at, you know, kind of any time of the day. And I think that's the whole thing about all of this stuff is it's really about the story of your business. I think when it comes down to just kind of simple things, what's the essence of your story? And then how do you kind of animate that or bring it to life in a way that makes the delight and the joy and the fun happen for your customers? I think a lot of times smaller isn't always easier. Bigger isn't always better. Design, I think, is like taking a big idea and then shaping it and getting it down to just its core essence, right? And I think that's the whole thing with like great experiences is a lot of really great experiences are just those really simple little things that make you say, oh, why didn't I think of that? The example that popped into my head, and it's an old one, if you've ever driven up Route 95 through Providence, Rhode Island, there is a business by the side of the road and it has a giant blue termite. And it's the big blue bug pest control company, but it's gigantic. This has been here since as long as I can remember. And it was built, I think, sometime in the 80s. And this is just a huge landmark. I mean, it's been in Family Guy. It was in Dumb and Dumber. It's this iconic thing. And it's for a pest control business, which really has no business doing this, but they did it. And it's delightful for me as a kid. Like it was like, <laughs> it was the sign that we were almost at my cousin's house. My parents had to wake us before we passed the blue bug. If I lived in Providence, I probably would be using them for pest control. I miss the heyday of roadside attractions, especially ones that featured weird giant objects like Randy's Donuts here in L.A., you know, just the big giant donut. Please bring them back. <laughs> can, can we, please bring these back. What you're describing there is one of the sliders that we have is a surprise and delight. And scale creates surprise and delight. Giant things or super small things. We often interpret those as fun. We're always talking about that in escape room design as well. Taking a concept and scaling it up makes it more fun. It makes it more accessible. It makes it for more than one person. There's a lot of things that scale brings that feel magical. We have a a game that we play at Adventure School and it involves rolling of a dice. And we have done both sides of the scale. We have played that game in groups where we have these huge inflatable die that they play with. And we've played it in groups where they have this almost imperceptibly small, really hard to find little tiny dies. And both of those create moments of delight because it's unexpected. You have to change how you normally interact with the thing to make it work. I love that. That's also sort of like in a place like Meow Wolf, where if you look through a small little hole and then you see a giant world in this tiny space, yeah, it's surprising and it's delightful. I just wanted to shift gears a little bit. Linda, when we were chatting in Denver, it sounded like Farm to Spaceship was funded by government programs in order to help these businesses improve their offerings with experiential interactions. I wasn't clear if Farm to Spaceship was funded by the government or if you help these local businesses find government funding. Uh, The resources to do adventure school come in a lot of different ways. Some of it is through cities and communities, and some of it's through grant programs. It just kind of depends on where we're working. Brian can speak to those mechanisms a little better than me. Yeah. The very first adventure school that we uh, created is in Centennial, Colorado. And funding for that program actually comes from their economic development office. And that funding was earmarked because you know they had the community go through a planning process of who do we want to be? And the community said, we want Centennial to be a place of really great and fun experiences from our neighborhoods to our shopping centers. And so because the community really kind of asked for that, then Economic Development Office was able to go ahead and create a fund that would then really start to bring that to life. And then we also work in San Luis, Colorado. And San Luis, it's the first town in Colorado. And it's a town of probably about 700 people. It's like super small. And so that particular funding to bring the Adventure School to San Luis came from a grant that is from 
a group of foundations in Colorado working to have artists work with other sectors to be able to integrate the power of arts. So it's like arts and. Again, that funding came from really kind of philanthropic partners. And then also the state of Colorado matched the, the funding from the philanthropic partners. So it really kind of comes from a lot of different places. If I were to attend adventure school, what would that process look like? What is adventure school? Well, it starts with a multi-day intensive, two or three days of coming together. And the focus of that is to create a cohort to create some shared purpose and to start just the basic building blocks of experience design. And then think of it as an apprenticeship that happens over several months, but it kind of depends on what sort of sector we're working in and how it exactly looks. They are given an opportunity to create experiences. They're getting a little seed funding and they get to create an experience, a prototype, and they get to test their prototypes and then they get to learn from their prototypes. And then there's a second round of funding. Not unlike the process that's been in place for apps and software and platforms for years. You get seed funding, you get to try some things, you learn some things, you get first round funding, second round funding. And we're trying actually to develop that lexicon for experiences for business and art as well. It's like, why is that path not available to experience artists as just like it is to maybe a software developer? I love this so much. <laughs> I knew you would. That's why I wanted to, <laughs> to bring them on to talk about this. Okay. So let me try to get this straight. The businesses that are participating, they are not paying money to come to adventure school. This is fully funded by the government. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure. That's awesome. Do you have any advice for people maybe in different states that are looking to get funding or are looking to work with their local governments to create a similar program? Like, how did you get started in this? Working within the public sector is it's all about what the community wants. To talk about the adventure school, we have to talk about really kind of everything that led up to then the creation of the adventure school. And so that was like probably about five or six years of engaging the community and right. really kind of working with them to understand what they need and also what they want and also kind of the future that they want to create. And so it was really a lot about kind of that community engagement and really kind of asking the question of what can we do together that we can't do by ourselves. You know, Linda and I always like to kind of talk about this work is it happens one friendship at a time. And so instead of these programs being parachuted into a community and then being like, hey, we built you this shiny thing, like come and come and use it. It's more like, hey, let's really kind of like actually make friends within the community, understand who these people are, what their businesses are, what their challenges are, what also what their opportunities are. And then really kind of think about how you start bringing that together to really kind of form that collective identity. And then all of that kind of stuff then leads into being able to unlock these resources from the public sector to be able to build something like an adventure school. When you talk about making the kind of thing that a particular community would want, what are some of the things that the community might not want? What are some potential negative outcomes? I think Brian sort of said it right there, to fly it in with a helicopter and drop it on a community. I think that's a really good example of a really prescriptive program or prescriptive solution. So those can stick out sometimes if you see them you're like, oh, this didn't come from the community at all. That reminds me of a story I heard in college where one of my professors was talking about a program that they had developed for like a farming community. I forget where, but basically it allowed them to have like multiple harvests in a year instead of just one. They spent years developing this program for them and how it would work. And it failed because they did not take into account the fact that the men would not farm. And in order to have two harvests a year, they required members of the entire community to all pitch in and work. And the men were just like, farming is for women. We're not going to do this. And they just they just would not. And it was all of these years of researching this program and how it would work for the land. It worked for the land, but because they didn't take into account the local culture, it didn't work. And so I went directly to that story when you were talking about parachuting a program into a community and not understanding how the local culture worked at all. So if we're talking about, say, even kind of like the private sector or the public sector, 
all of these like kind of lessons, right? Or this process is beneficial because it's kind of like the same of if you just go and open up a business <laughs> without maybe asking the community what they want, you might actually not hit the bullseye. You might not even hit the target at all. And I think all of this is just, again, about being really integrated into the community. And again, having lots of friends. And being a good neighbor. I, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a hard, that's why it's hard work. And I think that's why it's maybe not done as much because it requires you to kind of put yourself out there and to, again, be very vulnerable and to, again, just build these relationships. Is there any risk of having a community make too many experiential businesses and it starts to attract people from outside the community who might start buying up housing and increasing the cost of living, forcing people out of that community. Is that a potential risk here? For sure. I think generally the common narrative, especially when you talk about creative sector development, is that the artists move into the neighborhood. They start really kind of making it desirable. People with means start buying it up. And then the artists can't live in the neighborhood anymore. Then they have to move out. Knowing this or having this as a narrative, it's like, well, why aren't we solving for this, right? If this is what's happening, then why are we not solving for this? You want your communities to be invested in because that just means there's more resources, right? And we're kind of a more is more type of people. But how, how do we make sure that the value is recognized, right, and shared and so, again, going back to the idea of business models, if you know that this works, then how do we make sure on the front end that we're solving for some of these issues? And, you know, I think a simple example is with the business model ideas. Okay, so let's just say that you're hiring an artist to put a mural on the side of a building. Hopefully you pay the artist to go ahead and to put the mural on the side of the building. But... As artists, what else can we ask for, right? And how else do we own our value and our worth if we know that we're going to help increase the value of the neighborhood? What about actually some sort of like ownership stake, right? Equity in the actual building. And it's all about just like kind of right sizing it. So maybe it's like 0.1% or maybe it's 1%, 10%. I have no idea. It's really kind of thinking about how we can really be better negotiators because we know our value and then creating the conditions so everyone understands the contributions. And I think that right there starts to kind of lead into better conversations about really how do we create equitable and inclusive development. That's something that I think is important to maintain in the conversation because it's important for communities to grow together rather than have the value get extracted and end up somewhere else. Yeah, I think is what happens is, again, it's a very delicate ecosystem. And so I think, again, when you start to maybe extract the thing that created the positive energy or that started to attract all of that energy in the first place, when you start to extract that, then it starts to become stale. And I think of it like Easter is on its way and I keep on seeing all these like chocolate rabbits at the store is the difference between say the solid one versus the hollow one. And typically the hollow ones are the ones that are like the most decorative <laughs> and they look the coolest, but you bite into them and they're hollow. And then on the flip side, the like solid milk chocolate ones are kind of just plain on the outside, but they're solid. And so that's how I kind of think about some of these neighborhoods. It's like, oh, is that a hollow when you bite into it? Or is that solid when you bite into it? Okay. What comes next for the both of you? More of this. This this is a journey. We focus so much on the process. What we do is process. There's not necessarily product. So we are in constant conversation, constantly creating, constantly refining. The whole idea of adventure school is to create the conditions for trying. And we feel like try gets such a bad rap, but a community that can be seen to be trying things 
that's what a vibrant community looks like. So you create the conditions for someone to just try something and learn from it and then try again and try again. And that's what we're doing as well. We try and we learn and we try and we learn. Like we say, like Barton and I like to say, these are trying times. It's time to try. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And so where can people find you online or on social media if they want to follow more of your work? Our website. So farm to spaceship.com. Okay. And we will have links to that in the show notes. Linda, Brian, thank you so very much for joining us. This has been an exciting and enlightening conversation. Thank you. I, I feel the same way. It's been really fun. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so much. The Reality Escape Pod is produced by Lisa Spira. Music by Ryan Elder of RyanElderMusic.com. Edited by Steve Ewing of Stand Inside Media and brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. When David and I dreamed up this podcast, we ran into one problem. The first rule of escape rooms is you can't really talk about escape rooms. We can't really talk about them in full detail because of spoilers. So our answer to that was creating the Spoilers Club. This is content that you get at the $15 level. We have invited creators on from iconic, well-known escape rooms to do a walkthrough and recap of their room. It's one of the only places I know of where these rooms are documented in full. We get a lot of really tasty behind the scenes tidbits from the creators. And a lot of our patrons have told us that this is some of their favorite content that we've produced. We also have higher tiers available for those who really believe in our work and want to help us achieve our dreams of being able to work full time on Room Escape Artist and Repod. That really is what we're striving for here. We are trying to help elevate and support and nurture this community and this industry that we love so deeply and our Patreon supporters are the key to unlocking that future for us. If you want to help us out, you can learn more at patreon.com slash room escape artist. Details are in the show notes. Check that out. You've reached the end of this podcast. I have to imagine that that means that you've enjoyed yourself. And if you did and you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate it if you gave us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. This helps us in so many ways with increasing discoverability and it doesn't cost a thing. If you like what we're doing, it's a really easy way to help us out. Thanks. Thank you to our highest level Patreon backers. Breakout Games, Derek Tam, Olivier Escape, Escapism, Escaparium, Panic Room, Byron Delmonico, Josh Rosenfeld, Paula Swan, Rex Miller, Scott Olson, and the Ministry of Peculiarities. Thank you all so much for your ongoing support. I just want to describe an immersive comedy show that my comedy partners and I created years ago that is still one of our favorites. So basically the audience had to meet at a bar and in the bar were these members of a punk rock band that happened to also be the performers. And they were creating a song and they needed help from the audience to create this song and everybody had this great time. And then it was time to leave. And this band that was called Death Puke, that's what we called ourselves, said, hey, you guys can take our tour bus. And so they're like, okay. And then so they all went outside the bar and then that pulls this tour bus and everybody had to get on the tour bus. And, the, and when they got on the tour bus, it was an absolute wreck. You had to move something to be in any of the seats. Maybe it was a pair of underwear. Maybe it was a, a pizza <laughs> box. There were photos, all kinds of memorabilia that told the story of this band. And that is how this show went into motion was everybody got on the tour bus and the tour bus drove away. Nobody knew where they were going next. And eventually uh, around the corner, it broke down and everybody had to get off the bus. <laughs> and these workmen happened to show up in a truck and these workmen who happened to be the same characters that were in the bar, they had everybody help them fix the bus. 
and then we <laughs> decided we had to tow it. We tied a rope to the bumper of the bus into the to the truck, <laughs> and we towed the bus up the street and then took off. And then every step along the way, the characters would show up, and nobody knew what was going to happen next. And we, we went into the woods, and they wandered around, and they, they found all these characters. And I just so enjoyed creating that. It was a ton of surprise and delight. It was all the elements of experience design before I had the words for it. 